uh, today I'm going to present our work, Lego OS, a disseminated distributed OS for hardware resource disaggregation. It's a big project done with my colleagues, Yutong Huang, Hong, Yilun Chen, and our advisor, Yin Zhang. As some of you might have noticed, our author's name starts from Y, so you can also call us the Code Y team. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we all know, modern data centers deploy a bunch of racks. Each rack has some monolithic servers. The essential organization of a monolithic server has a, a motherboard that hosts a processor, some memory, and some storage devices. And then we run an operating system or hypervisor on top of it to run applications. So the monolithic server has been the unit of deployment in data centers for decades. Can you still satisfy all data center needs? Let's look, let's look at how it works with several hardware and application needs. Uh, let's first look at a, a simple example on resource allocation. Suppose now we have two servers with this amount of free resource, and that comes a job, job one, with this amount of requirement. To schedule it, we have to find a server that can provide both enough CPU and enough memory to schedule to server two. Now server two has this amount of uh, resource left. Now that comes a second job. Server one can provide enough memory, but not enough CPU. Server two can provide enough CPU, but not enough memory. So in general, uh, monolithic server make resource packing difficult because the server has to provide all resources needed. And second is uh, more heterogeneous hardware like FPGA, TPU, and VM are making their way into data centers. But they all face a practical issue. That is, they have to go into a server. And unfortunately, most existing servers are not planned beforehand. So there might be no extra PCI slots to host the extra device. And similarly, Monolithic server has poor support for resource elasticity. It's hard to add, remove, or recount the devices uh, after the server has been deployed. And finally, Monolithic server has cost grain failure to me. Let's say whenever we have um, CPU or memory controller failure, it usually means the whole server is done, even though the other components are still working properly. So going forward, how can we improve resource elasticity, uh, heterogeneity, and uh, for tolerance of Monolithic server? The fundamental cause is the physical server boundary. So we think we should go beyond physical server boundary. Or more formally, we call this approach hardware resource disaggregation, where we break a monolithic server into network attached independent hardware components. By that we mean uh, we break a server into multiple hardware components. Each component has its own controller and its own network interface and each one can run on its own and talk to each other through networks. We believe, so this disaggregate dis architecture is solve the limitations we mentioned above, and we believe it can meet future application and hardware needs. Resource disaggregation may seem a little bit futuristic to some of you, so is it really possible, feasible to build one in current data centers? We believe it is possible because of several recent trends. The first is network is much faster. For example, in Hibian, which can already provide 200 Gbps bandwidth, 600 nanosecond latency. Future optical fabric uh, can, can even reach 400 Gbps bandwidth and 100 nanosecond latency. So the cost of accessing remote resource is not that high. And the second reason is more processing power is pushed into the device. Devices like Smart SSD, Smart NIC, and processing memory can run quite, quite complex logic in their device. So we believe each hardware can run on its own. The third reason is network, phase, network interface is also moving closer to device. Intel's Omnipass, Mailbox, and Nova 2, both of them have the network logic on the board. In fact, many companies and academic institutions have been looking to this direction. We have the Intel Rack Scale System, Berkeley Firebox, HP the Machine, IBM Composable System, and the Red Box around Europe. Let me take a quick pause and give a preview of today's talk. So, I just finished the introduction of hardware resource disaggregation. Next, I'm going to present kernel architectures for resource disaggregation. And then I will discuss design and implementation of Lego OS. And after that, I will conclude today's talk. So, resource disaggregation is a complete diverge from traditional computing paradigm. The key question we want to ask is, how can a data center manage a cost of disaggregated devices? Or more specific, what operating system should we run? Let's look at some typical kernel designs. Kernels like monolithic kernel or micro kernel, they run on and manage a monolithic server. They assume they have local access to many shared resources like uh, memory, NIC, and disk. Several recent kernels, they use a multi-kernel design. 
where they run a kernel from each core or programmable device within a server. They also assume they have local access to all the resources. So are they a good fit for resource disaggregation? The first issue is what are used to within a monolithic server are now across network. Existing kernels can not handle um, this remote access. And more important, in a disaggregate cluster, we have many hardware resources and we need to manage them. And no existing kernels can handle this distributed network partition resources. And the last is each component can fail independently. And no existing kernels can provide this fine grained failure handling. So, what our operating system should be run? Our idea is when hardware is disaggregated, the operating system should be also. And by that I mean, when we are breaking the physical form of the server, we also break the operating system itself. And naturally, we break OS subsystems based on its functionality. We run process management on top of processor, virtual memory on memory, and similarly file system on storage devices. Based on this idea, we propose the split kernel architecture. We have several design principles in split kernel architecture. The first one is we separate OS functionalities into monitors and we run those monitors directly on hardware devices. This design makes it simple to integrate new, uh, new hardware. Let's say uh, Andrew invented XPU. To deploy it, we only, uh, we only need to implement the device, write a monitor, and then just attach to the network. The third design of split kernel is a choice of not supporting coherency between components. Doing so can great, greatly reduce the network traffic and every component is using uh, explicit message passing to communicate. The fourth is a split kernel should also manage distributed resources and handle failures. Based on this split kernel architecture, we build LegOS, the first disaggregated operating system for hardware resource disaggregation. So now I'm going to uh, Walk into the design implementation of LegOS, starting from the high-level abstraction to the design to the design and implementation emulation of it. Let's first start from high-level one. So the first question we want to ask is, how can uh, LegOS appear to users? Uh, should it appear as, as a set of hardware devices or as a giant machine, a single system image? Our answer is somewhere in the middle. We choose uh, to appear as a set of virtual nodes, which is virtual node. Vnode. Vnode is similar to a virtual machine. It has its unique ID, unique virtual IP address, and storage mounting point. But different from traditional VM, a Vnode can run on multiple hardware devices. Let me give an example on this. As you know, we have this Lego cluster with these uh, hardware resources. And a Vnode can run on multiple hardware devices. And each hardware device can host multiple Vnodes. Other than Vnode, we also uh, support um, backward Linux API compatibility. We can run unmodified Linux system calls. And internally, we use an uh, interaction layer to translate Linux interface to our own interface. Doing so can greatly ease the adoption of Lego OS. So um, now we know how to run applications on top of Lego. Let's take a closer look at the internal design. We have five main designs. Um, the first one is we cleanly separate our functionalities into monitors, and we build monitors with constrained hardware in mind. And we also build RDMA-based RPC framework, and we use a uh, two-level two approach to manage a distributed resource. And we also use replication to handle memory failures. Due to time limitation, today we just go through the first and the fourth design. Please refer to our papers for the rest of the designs. Now let's see how we apply the first principle on separating processor and memory. The first thing we do is, of course, um, move the memory resource, which is memory, DRAM, across network. After, in addition to moving DRAM, we also move the memory-related hardware units, such as TLB or MMU, across network to the memory component. Now we've moved hardware, hardware units, how about software, which is OS functionality, virtual memory system. We, we, we move the virtual memory system to the memory component as well and we write in the controller of memory component. And after moving all these units, now the processor only see virtual memory addresses. And because of that, uh, we, ch we change all levels of cache to virtual cache, which is uh, virtual index and virtual tag. As, as for the memory, 
it now will manage both virtual and physical memory management. Now we've separated processor memory, but we still have one challenge to solve, the performance. Based on the fact that network is still slower than local memory bus, especially the latency. Simply moving everything across network will not work. Our solution is to add some small DRAM or high bandwidth memory on the process side. But we, we use it differently. Instead of using it as a traditional main memory, we use it as extended cache or EX cache. The EX cache is managed by both software and hardware, and it is also inclusive virtual cache. So this is just one example of separating processor and memory. We also separate storage. Please uh, check the paper for the design of it. Now let's look at the first design, which is about how we manage distributed resource. We use a two-level approach to manage a distributed resource. We build several global managers to do cross-screen resource allocation. It also, they will also do load balancing and failure handling. We separate them into three global managers global process manager, global memory manager, and global storage manager. At each hardware, we do fine-grained resource allocation. Let's uh, look at an example on the, how LegOS manage the distributed memory. So in LegOS, we first chop user virtual address space into fixed-sized cross-grained virtual region, or V region. It can be configured such as 1GB. The global memory manager or GMM, will assign V regions to memory components when the application calls a virtual memory allocation system call, such as memory map. And GMM make the decision on where to create a region based on global resource load. And that's why, so in this example, the application tries to memory map 1.5 GP. So GMM needs to create two V regions. And GMM chose, choose M2 because M2 has more physical memory available. After a uh, region has been created, created each the owner of a region can do fine the grained resource allocation, virtual memory allocation, and it will allocate physical memory on demand. So in this case, the application further writes 1GB data, and M2 will allocate 1GB data accordingly. We implement LegOS uh, using commodity servers on x86, you know, x86 uh, servers. Currently, uh, we have 200k source map code and support around 100 system calls. To emulate processor, we reserve a small DRAM at boot time as EX cache. The heat pass is managed by software, and the miss pass is managed by LegOS itself. To emulate memory, we only enable limited number of calls to emulate the, eff the effect of uh, constrained hardware components. As for the storage and the global resource monitors, we implement that to implement as Linux kernel modules to, re, to avoid all the engineering efforts of uh, implementing device drivers. And for the network stack, all of them share one network stack, which is the RDMA based RPC framework. Okay, so let's see how Lego OS performs. We run unmodified TensorFlow with uh, Cyber 10 dataset work work workload. And the working set is around 0.9 GB, and we run four threads. The baseline of all these experiments is we run this TensorFlow on Linux with unlimited memory, which is the best, which is the best performance. And we compare systems, compare to several swapping systems, swap to uh, SSD, swap to RAM disk, and Infinity Swap. It's a remote, remote, it's a recent remote swap system. As we can see in the figure, um, the access is slowed down, and the lower the better. LegOS outperforms all existing solutions. In fact, LegOS only incurs 1.3 to 1.7 slowdown when disaggregating all resources. And in return, we gain much better resource packing, elasticity, and fail tolerance. To conclude, today we adjust the limitations of monolithic servers, and hardware resource disaggregation provide a promising viable solution for, uh, for future data centers. And we propose the speed kernel architecture, and we build LegOS. LegOS is a research operating system, and, but it is not the only way to build a speed kernel. But it demonstrates that it is feasible to disaggregate both hardware and operating system. In general, I believe resource disaggregation is a very promising area. It has great potentials, but it also has many unsolved challenges, such as the security and the network topology and congestion control. 
And by that, I will uh, end my talk, and uh, I have to take questions. Thank you for listening. And in this case, the process component is the only one to access resources like memory and storage. So my question is that, um, how this architecture will work if we consider other um, widely used accelerators in data center like TPU and GPU? Because uh, you may need to handle some consistency issues uh, between TPU and uh, CPU when they access some resources. Okay, so the question is, um how can LegOS implement uh, I mean, using other hardware? Yes, yes. So as I dem demonstrated in the uh, spin kernel architecture mm -hmm. picture, uh, to deploy an XPU, you only need to implement the device. You already have that. And then just write a monitor, and then just attach to the network. Then you can work with LegOS. So the only thing you need to do is write the monitor. That's our model. Uh, so um, do you need to do some um, consistency protocol between this um, there's different um, component because um, um, because they will access resources uh, um, at the same time. So uh, and you talk uh, very little about the consistency or coherence mo models. Actually, yes, this has to be considered. But uh, it, it, but it brought a very big question of how to implement that. I think we can take it offline. It'll be a <coughs> discussion. So uh, this, is, this is wild and I'm clearly going to have to read the paper. <laughs> One thing in the talk really stood out, you have a uh, virtual cache and M and U and T will be on the other side of the network. Yep. So that leads to two immediate questions. What do you do when you have to context switch and how long does that take? And, and also, where do you do protection checks? Okay, some questions. The first is, how do we do context switch on the process side? So this is the same as current that it won't be affected by using virtual cache. And the second is how we uh, do protection check. Let's say you've got a read-only page. How, how do you have to go across the network every time before you can retire the instruction? So, yeah, so if we do clean separation, yes, we have to go to remote to do permission checking. But we relax this principle a little bit by caching some information at processor so we can do permission checking at processor. That's our approach to that. Thanks. Uh, Xin Yang from MSR. So now you relocate the MMU into the DRAM. So how are you going to support the virtualization? How do you know when to go through the extended page table, when to go through the normal page table? So, okay, the question is how LegOS support virtualization? Um, currently, I don't have a very clear, clear answer to that because it, because it involves so many subsystems. But um, for for the virtual memory virtualization, I think we can do that on memory, but I'm not sure, quite sure about that, but we can discuss further. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the talk, Colin Lee, uh, Stanford University. Uh, can you say a little bit about uh, the failure model? So for instance, you mentioned that uh, unmodified Linux applications can run on this uh, kernel. Um, so what happens when one of your threads is running on you know, one physical machine and another threads on another physical machine? What happens if that machine Okay. Uh, the question is how uh, the failure model it is, right? So we have essentially three components: processor, memory, storage. Processor, since we only run uh, threads within uh, pro uh, processor, so the failure model is the same as current model. If it fails, it fails. Storage is the same. We assume application can provide this layer of reliability, so we let it as is. But we provide memory replication to protect and ensure the memory uh, component failure. And this is uh, listed in the paper. So to be clear, your applications have to fit, uh, the processor processing has to fit on a single physical machine. Uh, I don't quite understand this question yet, but I think we can discuss further. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. One more. Um, Atul Adil, Google. Have you thought about abstractions, which as an application writer I can use to take advantage of this model so that I can get very good performance? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? The Have you thought about abstractions that you can provide to application programmers so that uh, they can take advantage of this new architecture? Okay, so abstractions provided by the LegOS. So our now current goal is 
maintaining the current abstraction, so we can just run as is. But I think to run, to better run applications, we need to have some uh, tailored abstraction of LangOS, just to let application better use LangOS. Yes. Thanks. All right, let's thank our speaker.